On episode 276 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Robin Miller and discuss her book, Healed. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 276. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hello, and thank you so much for being a part of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast today. I'm really excited to share my interview with Dr. Robin Miller. But before we get there, I wanted to reach out and thank a reviewer. Dwayne left a review, and I really appreciate the review. And in his commentary, he indicated that he really kind of wished that I had a few more episodes out there than just once a week. Can't do that full-time, Dwayne, as you kind of noted. I do have to have a life. But that being said, because I do hear you, and I do want to let you know that I hear you, I am going to release uh, some additional episodes uh, over the course of maybe like the next four to five weeks. So if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I, I recommend that you do, because beyond just putting out the Monday episode, I'm going to begin putting out Thursday episodes. So you're going to start seeing uh, more frequent episodes for the next couple weeks, few weeks anyway, as I have the interviews, because uh, I I don't want to just put anything out for the sake of putting it out. But I do end up with sometimes getting a little, a few extra reviews, I mean, mean, interviews in there. So I am uh, Dwayne hearing you, and I'm going to respond by giving you a few extra episodes uh, to have in your playlist for this time. But you do need to be subscribed so that you don't miss any of these. So if you'll go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash review, you can leave a rating and review, which I will read and respond to. But beyond that, by subscribing to the podcast, you really do help get the message out there that people are interested in the podcast. It pushes us up on the ratings. So when people look at what's hot and what's out there, the more people are subscribing to a podcast, Apple sees that as a good sign that we're doing what you want and that you're here, you're wanting to hear our show and not miss any episodes. So please go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash review and you can do that today. So our guest today is Dr. Robin Miller and she is a medical practitioner that practices integrative medicine. She's been doing this for over 33 years. Is connected in lots of different ways and is part of the advisory board for one of uh, Dr. Oz's ventures, but really unique kind of approach to medicine and health. So I think her book Healed is something that for most of us, it's going to provide kind of a little different view than the standard medical view. So we kind of get into that a little bit about how the medical profession is going and then beyond that, just kind of ways that you can be involved and use the integrative medical techniques that she uses with her patients to make yourself more healthy. So without any further ado, I give you Dr. Robin Miller. So Dr. Miller, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed reading your book, Healed. And I think there were, you know, I wouldn't say that there was anything in the book that really kind of surprised me or caught me off guard because every once in a while I'll I'll read a book that I'll say, okay, uh, that came out of left field, whatnot. But I think you had a lot of what I would call uh, just great advice. And then I just kind of really like where the book went once we kind of got on the journey and got through uh, some of the, what I guess I'd call the, not, not, not boring, but more of the, you know, the stuff that you need to know to take care of yourself, to understand healthcare, to understand why some of these things might be happening to us. But when you actually got into the practical, what we're going to do about it, it was actually a very enjoyable read. Good. Thank you. So I wanted to kind of kick off because when I go in to see a doctor, obviously I probably spend more time, you know, I think the way you put it in the book, McDonald's medicine, I probably do spend more time at the drive through at McDonald's when I used to go than I do with my doctor. And so the term McDonald's medicine actually kind of resonated with me versus being an integrative healthcare provider, which is what you do now. Could you kind of compare and contrast those two styles and and when, when one's probably the best and when one, the other would maybe be better? Sure. Well, when I first went into medicine, I actually was in a regular conventional medical practice, internal medicine. And as time went on, I noticed that the visits were getting shorter and shorter. I was being asked to see people in much shorter periods of time. And I really felt like I wasn't doing anyone any justice. Uh, Just to break in real quick, when you say you were being asked, is this like a dictate from the insurance companies or from the hospital you were working with? or It was the clinic I was working with. And so, you know, they would they would set up my schedule and that's how it worked. So I, one day I was in the room with a patient 
writing my umpteenth prescription for this person, knowing that what she really needed for me to do was talk to her and get to the root of her problem. And I just at that point had this epiphany and said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I quit, which at which time I did, I signed up for Dr. Andrew Wiles Integrative Medicine Fellowship, which was a three-year fellowship. And after that, decided to set up my practice completely differently. So I don't believe there's a pill for every ill, which is the McDonald's concept right now, I think, where you know, I have pain, give me a pill. I want to lose weight, give me a pill. And I really believe now that it's important to get to the bottom of things. And I've seen that now over the last 11 years since I've started my integrative medicine practice, that when you actually sit with a patient, get to know them and talk to them, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to tell you what's wrong with them. And you can actually get to the root of the problem rather than just treating symptoms. I think that the quick approach works if you have a sore throat, if you have an acute infection, yeah, that's fine. Go to urgent care. But if you want to get to what is really going on with you, and if you want to be truly well, I think it's important to have a partnership with a provider, physician, nurse practitioner, whatever, where they get to the bottom of the issues with you and help you to figure out how you can be well long term. Yeah, because I, I mean, the thing I kind of get out of it when I would go to a doctor is they would, you know, they'd look at numbers, they would... uh you know, my labs, they would listen to what I had to say. And then basically it was a pill and it was, uh, you know, okay, this will, this will help with your high blood pressure, or this will help with your high cholesterol and this will help with the pain. And, and I would say, I don't like taking medicine. So oftentimes I'd say, well, gee, thanks. And I'd go on not feeling satisfied. I think there's, it's almost now become normal for people to kind of expect that you see the advertisements on TV. There's a pill for just about everything you could imagine having, and it, I guess it just makes it very easy for a doctor to say that's, you know, if that's how I'm going to satisfy the patient and my clinic, then that's the, the route I have to take. And I think really, you know, most of the time they're really just addressing a symptom. Why do I have high cholesterol? Why, why do I have high blood pressure? You know, why am I not feeling energetic and why am I not sleeping well? You know, all those things of just getting to the root cause. I think as, you know, I guess as an integrative health uh, care provider, you have more time to really kind of ask those questions to get down to the root of this is why you feel this way versus just, I give you this pill, you'll feel better tomorrow, but we're not really solving the problem. Exactly. And there's this great a story that's not in the book, but it was pretty telling. When I first got to my clinic in the early nineties, I was giving a talk to other doctors about preventive cardiology because that was my interest when I was in residency and fellowship way back when. And I was discussing the importance of eating healthy, getting exercise, all the things that I'm still talking about now. And a cardiologist got up and said, oh, no, you don't have to worry about cholesterol anymore because there's this new statin drug coming out and you can just take, give your patients the pill. Then they can eat whatever they want. <laughs> I was... I was astounded. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. And I think I read a paper one time where a Harvard, this is actually a Harvard educated doctor said nutrition will never work as a solve for cardiovascular disease because people won't change what they eat. He just gave up on the food option because he said people won't comply. So therefore it's not an answer to the question. I'm like, well, if they know what it means, uh, they want extra time with their grandchildren, by all means, they, they will change. <laughs> they will. Yes, yeah, so and we've seen that now with Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn, all of that. People will change. And you can reverse cardiovascular disease by doing healthy things. Yes. Now, I'm going to go to the doctor, and you put in the book four things that I should do to make sure that I get the most out of my doctor's visit. Would you mind going through those four things? Sure. Number one. One is be organized and you can make a list, but make sure the list is short because if you come in with a really long list, doctor's going to leave the room. So find out what it is you want to talk about and put it in a list because I can't tell you how many times people will throw the most important thing at you right before they, you're done and you won't get that issue discussed. So put a list together, be honest, be open. So if you are having an issue and it's embarrassing, it doesn't matter. We've heard it all. Just be open about what you really want and be honest. I can't tell you how many times I find things out afterwards. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that? And then the most important thing is be ready to change. Everyone has the story they tell themselves about what's wrong with them. 
but sometimes the story's not correct. Sometimes there's something else going on and you need to be willing to look at that and change. And if you can do that, then you have a much better chance of becoming healthy and well. And uh, what I really like is, is in the back of the book, you actually include a cheat sheet that someone can kind of go through to help get organized and then put their thoughts together so they can really kind of go in there ready to, ready to get some solution and actually start addressing the root cause rather than just the symptoms. Yes. And, and there's some tests in there that you can ask for and just, you can just show the sheet to the doctor so that they know what exactly you would like. I like organization. I like things that are just easy to act on. So that cheat sheet's uh, worth the price of admission. Yes, definitely. Okay, cool. Now, we're going to talk about a gene that is is kind of a, I'm not going to say it's a bad gene because there really aren't bad genes, but when you have a variant of this gene, it can cause some significant health problems. It goes by a, a rather rude name. I won't use that on the podcast, but it's the MTHFR gene. And I think people can figure out what that would probably be is if you try to make an acronym out of that, what I'm talking about as far as the slang. But with that gene, it causes some problems with gut health and depression. Can you kind of go through what's going on there and, and how maybe someone could find out if they do have a variant of that gene that would cause them some problems? Sure. So the MTHFR gene codes for enzymes in your gut that help you process folic acid. Folic acid is something we all need, or folate. You get it from either a vitamin or you can get it, hopefully, from green leafy vegetables in your diet. So when you take that in, a series of enzymes work on it and turn it into L-methylfolate. L-methylfolate is what your body needs to make serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. All those things that give you energy and make you feel good. Now, most of us actually have one mutation on that gene. Many of us including me, have two mutations on that gene. So your L-methylfolate levels are either down by 30% or even, in my case, over 70%. So what can happen with that, sometimes people, depending on the pattern of the gene, will have depression, irritable bowel syn- symptoms, and uh, lack of energy. And the treatment is pretty simple. You give people L-methylfolate, which comes in medicinal food or vitamin. So what I've noticed is when people do have these mutations and I give them L-methylfolate in varying amounts, their mood gets better and in many cases their irritable bowel goes away because what people don't understand is that the gut is lined with brain cells. If you looked under a microscope, it would look just like a brain cell and then serotonin. So it's a serotonin-related system and when you give the L-methylfolate, then you're able to make serotonin. Right. And serotonin is kind of like a, a relaxing neuro processor, right? Yeah. It's a neuro, neurotransmitter that you know, helps with well-being. And so the antidepressants that people take oftentimes are actually blocking the uptake of serotonin, giving the brain more serotonin and helping with mood. So in this case, what you're doing by taking the, the folate, by, by basically fixing your folate, you're able to actually then kind of hit the root cause, which is the fact that you're just not absorbing as much or not utilizing as much as you need. And therefore you have to supplement. Well, you're not making as much. Oh, okay. Not making as much. So you have to supplement. So the L-methylfolate allows you to make more. Cool. I know it is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's because it's not a drug and there's, uh, there's probably little, if, if any ill effect of taking this because it's almost a food product or is a food product. Yeah. It's considered medicinal food. So a couple things. Number one, if you want to know if you have the gene, um, mutation. You can do it with a blood test, which is covered by Medicare. It's no longer considered experimental. Many insurances will cover it. You can also do it with a cheek swab. You can do it with 23andMe. We'll give you that result. The only risk of taking too much L-methylfolate is if you are somebody who hasn't had it for a really long time, because that's how you were born, you have to kind of start slow in many cases. Otherwise, you can get what looks like serotonin syndrome, which is where you get agitated and it can make things worse rather than better. Okay. So it'd be something they would taper into and your doctor, particularly if they were an integrative health specialist or healthcare provider, they would be able to help you figure that out. Yes. Most integrative medicine doctors and functional medicine doctors know how to do this. Now, I'm a, I'm a big fan of lists. <laughs> and, and, and so you have really? a list. I, am, I, I never just... could have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you have a list of 12 quick, economical, doable things. And like I said, I do like lists, particularly actionable things, doable things. So do you mind going through those 12 doable things? Not at all. So this list was compiled by my co-author, Dave Kahn, who wrote the book with me. 
um, who's a big weightlifter. Um, he's totally into fitness. And he came up with this great set of QEDs, he calls it. So number one is you can't diet. No more dieting. Diets don't work. In fact, a diet, if you're going on a quote-unquote diet, it almost ensures that you're going to gain weight in the end. So what we really need to do is come up with eating patterns, the kind of foods that are going to work for us in terms of keeping us healthy and fit for a lifetime. That's the important thing. Because you can drop weight really fast by eating one food all day long. I mean, they even had the Twinkie diet. Remember that? Yeah. And do you know the, the pen of Penn and Teller, he went on a, a potato diet. Yeah. I mean, you'll lose weight, but you'll gain it back and more afterwards. <laughs> so you want to eat foods that are healthy, that keep your gut healthy, which is really important for the microbiome and that will help you maintain a healthy weight. And it's something you can do for life. That's the key. That's number one. Number two, weigh yourself. I know it's hard to do. Even I have a hard time getting on the scale and looking. I sometimes have to like hide my eyes just to make sure because, oh my gosh, what if I gained a pound today? Anyway, weigh yourself. You, some people do it daily. Some people do it monthly. Some people do it weekly. Whatever's going to work for you so you can be accountable to yourself. Number three is move. And you don't have to like do, you know, really rigorous exercise. You just have to move. There was a study recently that showed that many women won't get out there and exercise because they think it's just going to be too hard. And they're thinking about going to, you know, how you go to the gym, you do weights, you do this, you do that. But actually just walking, like walking through a park is moving. It's exercise. So if that's what it takes to start, that's what you need to do. Just move. Number four is stop drinking your calories. I mean, how many people are going to the coffee places and having these mocha, mocha, latte, whatever that can get up to 700 calories? You don't even realize. You think, oh, it's liquid. It's coffee. I'm, I'm not. It's pretty good. You know, it's heart healthy. It's healthy. It's not. So make sure <laughs> that you know what you're drinking Sugary soda are horrible. They give you no nutritional value, and all they do is just give you sugar and calories. That needs to stop. Drink water. In fact, you can flavor your water with fruit. So there are these grinder. Have you seen them? There are these little grinder things where you have the water bottle and a grinder underneath. Yeah, well, I've seen where you can put the fruit, and it sort of just sits in the water, and the water is able to kind of take in some of the essence and flavor from the fruit. Yeah, that's great. So that's another option that you have. Number five is to eat consciously. How many of us eat in front of the television set or the computer screen or our phones? Before you know it, a whole bag of chips can be gone if that's what you're eating. And you don't even remember eating them. So it's time to really look at your food, think about it, eat consciously. Six is interesting. It's about meal timing, not eating late at night, but also there's this amazing study that they did in Israel where they took, I believe it was 90 women, half of them, they had most of their calories in the morning, half in the evening. So they gave these women the same exact food, only they timed it differently. So the breakfast group got 700 calories for breakfast, 500 for lunch, 200 for dinner. The dinner group got it reversed, 200 calories for breakfast. 500 for lunch, 700 for dinner. All of them had the same exact food. It lasted for 12 weeks that they did this study. The difference was that the dinner group lost seven pounds. The breakfast group lost 17 pounds. Same food, exactly the same, but the weight loss was significantly greater in those who had the major calories in the morning. So if you did nothing else, if you just had the same food you have every day and you switched when you ate it, you will lose weight. Very interesting. Seven is eat at home. So when we eat out, somehow it doesn't count. Or when we eat in the car, it doesn't count. So if you can eat at home, that would be great. If you're asked out to dinner, maybe you might want to eat before you go and just have a salad with your friends. That's another option. Number eight is if you have trouble doing this on your own, get help. Phone a friend. Do it with a friend. Women especially do really well when they do it. this as a group in terms of support and really helping each other. Yeah, I, I found that particularly true when they get into a movement practice and you start talking about, you know, I'm going to I'm going to walk during lunchtime, having a friend that's going to walk with you kind of make sure that you have those shoes and your, you know, some comfortable shoes in your in your bag so that when you show up for work, you're not letting your buddy down by telling him you can't walk at lunchtime because you forgot your shoes. Exactly. That really helps. 
And number nine is go slow. Don't have like, you know, expect to lose 10 pounds in a week. Actually, what you really want to go for is one pound a week. That's really important. And it's important for a lot of reasons. One is that your body is programmed to keep you where you're at. So if you start losing weight and you lose a lot of weight, you are going to be driven by your brain to gain that weight back. You'll start having cravings and it'll be very difficult to resist. So if you go slowly, you kind of trick your body into changing its set point. And this is a really tough one because I think, you know, a lot of times what we'll find is we start working with a client that wants to lose weight and the first week is great. They lose three pounds or four pounds the first week and it just through a few, few simple changes and they feel great about that. And then the second week, maybe it's two pounds and they're a little disenfranchised because they had hoped to lose another four. And then the next week it's one pound and they're upset. And then the next week it's another pound and they're, they're even more upset because they're like, why can't I have another four pound week? And I'm like, well, that's not the way this works. You know, you're on track. One pound a week is, is awesome. Occasionally your body will decide it wants to be a lower set point and it'll go there. But you just have to let that be the natural course and not feel like you're failing. Even if you have a week where there's no change at all, if you know you're on the right path, you're moving more, you're eating better, uh, you've made these positive changes, give it time and your body will catch up with what you're trying to do and will take you down gradually. And you know, most people have gotten there slowly. Their weight's gone up slowly. And so taking it off slowly definitely makes a lot of sense in terms of long term. Yeah, I don't think any of us put on four pounds each week as we came up this way. So <laughs> expecting to go down that fast is just not quite uh, reasonable. Exactly. And number 10 is make reasonable goals. So just as you're saying, just you want it to stay off. So you really want to do it gradually. You know, make I always tell people, he may say, well, you know, do you think I should lose 40 pounds? I said, no, let's just try for five here. Let's Try for five in the next few months and see what happens. And then we'll just go from there. And what I like to do, what I like to do with a lot of my clients is to say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to come up with something that you, you want to do, not just weight loss, but let's say you decide that you want to be able to walk a mile in under 15 minutes. So we say, okay, well, we're going to start walking and we're going to see how fast we can walk now. And is that now reasonable to say 15 minutes Maybe you walk it now in 20 minutes. So we say, okay, how about we want to cut a minute off of our mile, just one minute. And then they find within a month, they do that. And now let's hit that next minute, you know? And then of course, over the course of six to eight months, we get them down to that 15 minute mile. Yep. There's a, a great story that we talk about in the book where there was a woman that I actually interviewed many years ago who was a hundred pounds overweight initially. Her husband left her for a much thinner woman and he was, you know, normal weight. And she just was so depressed and beside herself. She just felt so bad. She had to get out and start walking. So the first day she started, you know, a block the next day, two blocks after several weeks, she was walking a mile, started noticing she was losing weight and it felt better. So she kept walking and started eating better because she realized it made her feel better. And after two years, she lost the hundred pounds. And she was back to normal weight. It took two years, but she felt great, looked amazing. Her skin actually snapped right back. She didn't even have hanging skin. And the interesting thing is the husband and his new wife, the one he left her for, gained all her weight back. <laughs> that <laughs> nice was little poetic gift, huh? Yeah, <laughs> nice little gift. <laughs> <laughs> so um, number 11 is hunger's your friend. You know, we all are afraid of hunger. Oh my gosh, I'm hungry. What, I have to eat something. No, you don't. You don't. Just have a glass of water and keep on until, you know, you really, you know, can find something healthy and eat along whatever your regular meal time is. Hunger's okay. And number 12 is remember that you're in charge. This is your body. You can do this and have faith in yourself. So those are the QEDs. Yeah. And I particularly like the last one because I, I, I think, you know, so many times people feel a little helpless in this journey. And the reality is nothing you mentioned in any of the other 11 were really all that difficult to wrap your mind around. And even if you just added one this week and saw how it went, and then you added another one the next week and do them till they stick, 
over time, like you said, she did one block. How many people would do one block and just feel so disgusted with themselves that they wouldn't get back out there to find out that they could do two blocks? And so I think to me, it's, it's it understand that you, you can do your body. And I, like you said, her skin went back and the whole thing. Your body is such an amazing thing. If you'll treat it right, it will heal. It will get where it needs to be, which again, the title of the book is Healed. It is. Uh, the body is amazing. And so from this now, I want to get into your story because you, you, now you start touching on, on who you are and some of your story of getting into dancing and how that kind of became a big part of your life and how you've seen some you know huge advantages to dancing. So I kind of want to get into your story and then kind of talk about the value of dancing from there. Oh, yes. I love talking about dancing. <laughs> so that was pretty much what started off this whole idea of writing this book. So I was asked about oh, eight years ago to be part of the Rogue Valley Dancing with the Stars fundraiser. So it was like Dancing with the Stars locally. And I did the Argentine Tango. It was for a group called the Sparrow Club, which raises money for kids to actually help other kids who are struggling with cancer or other illnesses. Really cool organization. So I started dancing. I had not done ballroom dancing at that point until then, when I was, except for when I was in eighth grade, my mother made me go. The amazing thing <laughs> about that is I've been to Argentina and I've seen the tango. So I, I'm impressed that that was your first dance to learn because I, I probably would have gone with something a little simpler. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a really cute partner. That's what kept me going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was a tough one. That's the toughest one to learn first, I think. But it was really, really fun. And during the process of learning the tango and doing this dance, several things I noticed were happening to me. I lost weight. My body got tighter. I got stronger. I had this chronic neck pain gone by the end of that whole process. Um, My balance was better. My thinking was clearer. And I started wondering, wow, this is pretty amazing. And I didn't want to stop. So I kept doing the tango, and then when I kind of ran out of teachers, I found Dave, who's my co-author, who teaches West Coast Swing, and that's a really fun dance as well, and you keep reaching to get better on that one, and I'll never be fantastic, but it's really fun to keep learning and getting better, and so again, I've noticed that I just keep getting healthier and more fit with the dance, and then we saw, both Dave and I saw this study on Alzheimer's disease where they looked at activity levels in seniors who they were studying. Um, They studied them for five years, over 400 seniors. At the end of five years, 124 of them had developed dementia. Then they looked at their activities to see which activities helped decrease the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And it was really fascinating. So cycling, swimming, golfing did 0% in terms of decreasing the risk. Reading decreased it by 37% crossword puzzles by about 45%. There's one activity that decreased the risk of Alzheimer's by 76%. And that was ballroom dancing two to three times a week, which I thought was just amazing. So that kind of is what spurred our interest and kind of stimulated the idea for writing this book on healed, (laughs) how to be healed. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know, you know, I've actually, I've taken some lessons before because when I was getting married, not married her anymore, That's but when, when I was getting married, well, right, she wanted to, <laughs> she wanted us to be able to dance, you know, at the reception after. And I was kind of like, okay, so we took these dance lessons and you're, you know, you're trying to do the dance without muttering one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a uh, trying to keep your brain on and trying to shut it down and just keep up with what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be doing. So it, it is a thought exercise. It's not just a physical exercise. So I, I can definitely see how, it really is something that's, that's going to keep and some other advantages and things you've put in the book or balance. Uh, you mentioned uh, weight loss. You felt more athletic. Your body healed itself from many of the, not necessarily injuries, but pains that you had because you just started feeling better. And I started walking better. My posture was better too. And I think that was part of it as well. And the thing about partner dancing that's so good is that there are, first you have to understand what's going on in your own body and and control that, but you also are interacting with someone else. And what that does is it builds new neural networks in the brain. And that, I think, is what helps keep your brain healthy. It's interesting when you see people with Parkinson's disease 
ballroom dance helps them as well in terms of their movement. Because what it does is, again, it bypasses the part of the brain that's injured and builds new neural networks around it. And there's so fascinating story on Facebook and YouTube by a gentleman named Rafi Elder in Israel. He's a professor who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease eight years ago and just didn't like the idea that there was nothing he could do. The doctors told him there was nothing he could do to decrease the progression of the disease. So he decided to do his own research and found that ballroom dancing would help. And sure enough, he dances the cha-cha and he has won awards. You watch him dance on this video, it's remarkable. And it, his movement, his quality of movement has remained the same over the eight years as a result of dance. Very impressive. Okay. If you don't mind sending me a, a link to that, I'll include that in the show notes. Sure. It's really, I mean, the video is amazing. I will send it to you. Okay. And I agree. I, you know, the, the physical plus, you know, and I think another thing that I, I find kind of fascinating with all this dance, like you said, it, it's partner, but it's also very much a social scene. And a lot of the things when they start talking about longevity and the benefits to have good longevity, one of the things that you, is a good factor for that is your social skills, your social interactions. And if you have good social interactions, that helps people live longer. And so that's another kind of advantage that I kind of see with all of that. It's definitely not a bad hobby to have. <laughs> Absolutely. And the thing is, there are a lot of people out there with social anxiety. And this is really good for them. Because if you go to like a dance lesson, you don't have to talk to anybody. All you have to do is follow the teacher. And eventually, you will feel like talking to people and you have something in common to talk to them about the dance lesson. And so it's wonderful for people who are shy and who do have social anxiety, and you end up with a whole little social life around the dance community. And in fact, at the end of the book, we have a list of all the dance conventions around the country if people are interested in starting to learn there, because most dance conventions will give people beginning lessons for free. And that's a really good place to start. And it is, is. But I mean, there's tends to be dance studios that do uh, ballroom dancing to Western dancing, uh, like you said, swing. So there, there are lots of opportunities to go out. And it's, it's really not that expensive, particularly if you sign up for the group classes, because I've done some of those before. And when they have a group in there and it's not the one-on-one -on -one lesson, it, it is really economical for you to go in. And you're meeting new people, like you said, because your dance partner is someone else that showed up for this group class. And it's pretty cool. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I highly recommend it. Okay. So if someone wanted to learn more about you or get the book, where would you like for me to send them? Well, it's on Amazon.com. And we have a website wellhealed.net. Okay. Wellhealed.net. I'll be sure that's in the show notes. So if you go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash 276, I'll have all the links. And, and again, a link to that YouTube video. So we can make sure that you, you get to see that guy dance. Um, Cause I'm sure it's pretty exciting. Oh, it's a great video too. It'll give you chills. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to you sending me the link. I want to see it. Dr. Miller, thank you so much for being a part of 40 plus fitness. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed today's episode, would you please go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash review. That'll take you to iTunes where you can subscribe to the podcast, give us a rating and review. By subscribing, you won't miss an episode and you'll also tell iTunes that you're very interested in this show, which will help us move up the charts. More people will find us and more people will be helped. So please go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash review and leave us a review, a rating and subscribe today. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Molly Tuninsky and discuss her book, The Low FODMAP Diet for Beginners. Until then, have a happy and healthy day. <music>